You can't go back. You can't recapture those simpler, quieter, more gracious times of the past. Everyone will tell you that. Well, everyone's wrong. Just 70 miles west of the hustle and bustle of Denver exists a time machine. Unlike H.G. Wells' time machine, this one's real. You can go back. You can ride a time machine. You can ride the Georgetown Loop Railroad. Mist still hangs low in the valley as number 40 is fired up. All steam engines used on the Georgetown Loop Railroad are oil burners. The firing up process is a carefully orchestrated symphony of sound and movement, as complicated as any ballet, though much noisier. Steam locomotives are perhaps the ultimate mechanical device. This locomotive and its stablemate, number 44, both pulled trains on the International Railway of Central America. They were located in El Salvador and made much of the trip to the United States border under their own steam power. Not without incident, however. Number 40 was purchased in 1968, but political unrest kept the engine in El Salvador until 1972. Today, number 40 will pull several hundred passengers on the four and a half mile trip. By the short season's close, the Georgetown Loop Railroad will carry nearly 100,000 passengers. Train lovers, thrill seekers, or just plain tourists. No special reasons are needed to ride a train like this. Let's fuel up the engine for a run. The steam-powered pump on the right is hooked up to a steam line on the engine and pumps oil from the tanker on the left to fuel the engine to make the steam which pumps the oil. Sort of perpetual motion. And the result? Well, come on, let's take a ride. The locomotive has spent the night at Silver Plume and it will hurry down to Georgetown. The train moves through the golden aspen and cool days of autumn, passing the Hall Tunnel, site of a mine. Mining caused this railroad to be built. We finally reach the Georgetown platform and can begin our trip. We back down under the high bridge so we can say we have made the complete circle of the loop traveling over ourselves.
Our train crosses Clear Creek for the first of four times. Rounding a curve, the locomotive eases out into Devil's Gate Viaduct, 300 feet long, 100 high, and the second crossing of Clear Creek. Here we cross over where we started minutes ago. One day in 1859, George Griffith rusted by a big beaver pond and stumbled on the only spot where gold was found in this valley. The town that grew from this single incident of gold and success was unlike most mining camps of the day. From the very first, Georgetown seemed to be a gentler, more refined, more polished place to live than the typical mining camp. Homes reflected an elegance that was mirrored in the fine architectural details of the commercial buildings. Pride in community was exemplified by the flashy, uniform volunteer fire department. Georgetown never was destroyed by a fire, a tribute perhaps to these hardy men. Georgetown could boast of one of the finest hotels anywhere, the Hotel de Paris. The food and wines were unmatched, as were the accommodations. A hotel fit for royalty. Yes, Georgetown was not your usual mining camp. Silver, not gold, made Georgetown. There were rich veins of silver on both steep sides of the canyon walls that squeezed the town. Finding the silver was only one of the problems faced by the prospectors. The ore had to be transported to market. Steep mountain grades and poor roads proved difficult in the ascent and dangerous in the descent for oxen or mule-powered wagons. A railroad was the only answer. Mountain railroads are different from railroads found in the plains. The steeper grades and tighter curves necessitated smaller equipment running on rails only three feet apart, hence the name narrow gauge. But even for narrow gauge, some areas seemed impossible to conquer. The two and one-tenth miles from Georgetown to Silver Plume seemed just such an area. Silver Plume is 638 feet above Georgetown, and the straight line climb was not possible. The narrow canyon complicated the problem. The solution, called the Devil's Gate Viaduct, later the Georgetown Loop, was a high iron bridge rising almost 100 feet above Clear Creek, crossing over itself with a span of almost 300 feet. It was an amazing feat of engineering. Surveyed in 1879, construction began in 1881 and was completed in 1884. Noted Colorado newscaster Carl Akers put it best. Of all the absurd places that rails went in the mountains, they said this was the absurdest, and they were right. In order to traverse the two and one-tenth miles between the two camps, the engineer Jacob Blickensdorfer had the tracks cross over themselves to go through a hairpin turn and a horseshoe curve, all the while climbing up the canyon. It took nearly four and one-half miles to go the two-mile straight line distance. At last, poor mind in the canyon could reach the market. The boom lasted a scant nine years. The repeal of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act brought a decline of silver prices that finally closed most of the mines. But all was not lost. Tourists had discovered the loop. 
The trip from Denver to Georgetown was an easy one-day excursion. The scenery was spectacular, and of course there was nothing like the Devil's Gate Viaduct anywhere. Tourists soon replaced ore as the paying load. This rare motion picture footage shows a tourist train going over the Devil's Gate Viaduct in 1904. This is one of the earliest known examples of a motion picture camera placed on a moving platform. It is also the only known motion picture footage of the original loop. Tourists haven't changed much. Notice this rare view of a second train crossing the Devil's Gate Viaduct. This view of Georgetown is an invaluable aid to historians. Tourism became Georgetown's and Silver Plume's sustaining industry. A vast array of souvenirs attest to the worldwide acclaim of the Georgetown Loop, postcards by the thousands. But there were other, more elegant keepsakes to take home. This magnificent sterling silver spoon, circa 1910, is engraved with the image of the Loop in its bowl. One side of the engraved handle depicts a miner in the state seal of Colorado, and the other side is a bucking horse and covered wagon. This exquisite souvenir teacup made in Germany around the turn of the century demonstrates the international scope of the loop. No one expected to ride the train to Georgetown through the cool, clear air of autumn, or to again hear the sounds of steam engines echo off the canyon walls. No one except a few railroad enthusiasts and some far-sighted members of the Colorado Historical Society. When an interstate highway was to be built through the site of the loop, the Colorado Historical Society fought to have that highway relocated high on the canyon wall. Without that effort, the Georgetown Loop could never have been rebuilt. The Georgetown area had retained much of its charm and identity from its Silver Camp days. In 1966, both Silver Plume and Georgetown were designated as National Historic Areas. The Colorado Historical Society realized that a mining and railroad park would complete the area's heritage. The town has several museums, such as the famous Hotel de Paris and the restored Hamel House. But before we start the story of the Loop's reconstruction, let's return to our trip and enjoy more of Colorado's scenery. Our train approaches the Hall Tunnel, a mining tunnel. Here rest stored railroad cars and antique mining machinery of another era. Passengers glimpse the Lebanon mine, where visitors can walk into the side of a mountain.
crosses Clear Creek for the third time, this time over Turntable Bridge. Coming out of a cut, Clear Creek is bridged for the fourth and final time. A firm with experience in running tourist railways petitioned the Historical Society to operate a railroad over the old right-of-way and was awarded a 30-year lease to do so. The Union Pacific, who once owned the loop, was very supportive. They donated two and a half miles of rail if volunteers would dig it up. And then one of those minor miracles happened. It seems that the local U.S. Navy Reserve Mobile Construction Battalion, the Seabees, had gone a long time without building a railroad. Since a rail line is essential in time of war, they offered their services to build a trackage. The Pin Trust Bridge was found on an abandoned portion of the Colorado and Southern lines. Photos show that it is almost identical to the original one used. Some official decreed that the bridge had to be transported intact. This did present a few problems. Eventually, they had to take it apart anyway. Ties and rails were laid from this bridge towards Silverplume to the west. The first train over the bridge was this newly arrived narrow gauge diesel. Purists were upset that the first wasn't a steam engine until they realized that if the bridge had failed for some reason, it would be better to dump a diesel engine into the drink than a steamer. Apologies to any diesel fans in the audience. With trackage ready, the number 40 was loaded up in Central City. Following the route of its Colorado and Southern predecessors, the engine made its way up Clear Creek towards Georgetown. The original Silver Plume Depot was moved into place by the Seabees. These fellows played an immeasurable part in the construction of the line. Many of them became so caught up in the project, they worked even on weekends when the battalion was not active. Once in Silver Plume, the Seabees added their personal touch. Equipment for the line was collected from all over Colorado and many other places. In August of 1974, steam returned to the canyon after four decades. East of the Pin Trust Bridge, the pilings for the next crossing had stood quietly since the abandonment. With some detective work and a lot of luck, the original bridge was found near Denver. The bridge was actually designed to be a turntable on a standard gauge railroad. But the engineers who laid out the original line were delighted to find that it was the right length to span the river. As with all of the projects, great care was taken to ensure historical accuracy. The first train over the turntable bridge ran in 1975. It was, of course, the diesel. The diesel was built in 1943 by General Electric for the Oahu Railway in Hawaii. Over the years, number 15 has proven its worth to the railroad. During the bicentennial celebration of 1976, nearly every railroad in the country painted some of its equipment for the occasion. Steam-powered trains were soon hauling tourists over the turntable bridge. When the trains reached this point down the valley, it allowed the Colorado Historical Society to open another phase of this outdoor museum. Guides escort visitors into the depths of the Lebanon silver mine for a glimpse of what it was like. The Seabees also helped restore the outbuildings to complete the mine complex museum. New projects, such as additional sightings to display equipment, as well as general maintenance, kept the railroad busy. But it seemed as if the railroad was destined to go no further. The next step would be to rebuild the high bridge. All that remained were the abutments. Conservative estimates put the cost at a million dollars. Yet another miracle. 
Denver's Butcher Foundation offered a grant for a million dollars to rebuild the high bridge. Following that were grants of $400,000 from the Gates Foundation and $200,000 from the Atlantic Richfield Foundation. The loop would indeed be rebuilt. Construction began in June of 1983. When the original bridge was built, the railroad had a difficult time obtaining enough help. In spite of high wages, men would take the free train ride from Denver, take one look at the bridge, and slip off to get a much safer job in the mines. As each span was eased into place, at least one official would ride up with it on the crane. If you look carefully, you can still see some of the official's fingerprints embedded in the steel where they had a grip. In an interesting case of completing the circle, the center span took a ride on the rails itself before assuming its new job of supporting rails. The structure was completed on September 25, 1983. The Colorado's weather took over. Rails were not laid until the following spring. The first train across the bridge was pushed by the diesel. Quietly and with no fanfare or cameras around on the night of May 30, 1984. The diesel pushed this flat car loaded down with rock for ballast across first. Finally, at 7.58 a.m. on June 1st, Shea engines number 8 and number 14 backed down from Silver Plume and eased confidently onto the bridge. The number 8 whistled, and the number 14 answered in triumph, announcing that the time machine had been completed. The echoes reverberated down the canyon and through time itself. Steam had returned to the Devil's Gate Viaduct. As you probably noticed as it crossed the high bridge, chaise are different. If steam locomotives are indeed the ultimate mechanical devices, then chaise are the ultimate steam locomotives. Chaise transfer power to the wheels through a series of helically cut gears and universals. This makes the engines less stiff and more powerful, but slower. Shays can climb steeper grades and negotiate sharper curves. The Georgetown Loop Railroad has three of these unique locomotives. The final piece of the puzzle fell into place when a plate girder bridge was found in Nebraska and transported to Colorado. The loop was completed by Spanning Clear Creek for the fourth time. The Morrison Foundation donated the funds to build a visitor center at the Georgetown end of the railroad. Silver Plume hasn't been forgotten during all this time. A new engine facility has been completed, which allows maintenance of the locomotives during the long winter months. Let's climb up the big fill and finish our trip to Silver Plume. From the Big Fill, you can clearly see the Devil's Gate Viaduct and Georgetown in the distance. Lindsay Ashby shares with us what the future holds for the Georgetown Loop Railroad.
Oh, there always has to be something uh, in the future, and there's talk right now in Silverplume about the Argentine Central, which would run maybe 12 miles up to the old ghost town of Waldorf and on to Mount McClellan, just a, a hair under 14,000 feet. With the Colorado Railroad Museum, the Cumbers and Toltec, the Durango and Silverton, and of course the Georgetown Loop, Narrow gauge railroading hasn't been this popular in Colorado since that first gold strike in 1859. Come on, ride a time machine. Ride the Georgetown Loop Railroad.